I'm Ben Kefalinos, and I'm very pleased to I tell you that we're having a distinguished speaker with us today, Professor David Eisenhower. Let me tell you a few things about David. Uh, the topic, of course, will be the title of the book, Going Home to Glory, A Memoir of Life with the I.D. Eisenhower, 1961-1969. Uh, David Eisenhower is currently the director of the Institute for Public Service of the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania. He received the Provost Award for Distinguished Teaching in 2003. And he was also a finalist in the Pulitzer Prize in History in 1987 for his work entitled Eisenhower at Work, 1943 to 1945, a book about the Allied leadership during World War II. With this, I'd like to introduce you to you, David Eisenhower. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nick and John and Talca, Tony. Uh, good to see everybody here today. Uh, uh, Nick, yes, uh, my escape from my grandfather's admonitions was a narrow one. Uh, I did go to Amherst. Uh, he had an idea that uh, uh, maybe I would make a good West Point cadet. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I found myself one of the one of the earliest things that I narrate uh, in this book is the Marbles Regiment that I found myself on in the spring of 1961. I had flat feet, uh, and so the idea was you pick marbles up with your toes, uh, deposit them in dishes and so forth, and build up arches. Uh, overcome uh, uh, flat feet and so forth. I was uh, being given the opportunity uh, to go to West Point, but I did not take the opportunity to go to the Navy instead. Thank you very much for having me uh, at the lunchtime event uh, at the Hourglass here to talk about uh, going home to glory. Uh, I cannot re resist uh, uh, observing, uh, Nick, that when we set this date, uh, I estimated that uh, late April, about the time of the uh, classes ended, uh, would mark the return of Henry Tooney uh, to his accustomed place at the long table uh, in our main dining room. Uh, I was looking forward uh, today to making a set piece presentation uh, on a book topic uh, which Henry and I had uh, uh, spoken of together for uh, a long time, really from the inception. Uh, of this book, which has, uh, I think, a rather uh, interesting story. Uh, the Going Home to Glory, which has uh, been recently published by Simon Schuster, uh, actually originates a long time ago. Uh, in 1976, when I was graduating from George Washington University uh, Law School, our friend, Julie and I had a friend by the name of Ben Stein, uh, who had become <coughs> quite famous and as a comedian, uh, he's actually a Yale lawyer, and if you go to Yale Law School, you can be anything, a comedian, uh, a screenwriter, a uh, vice president, a president, whatever you want to be, and Ben is one of these things. Ben at the time was a writer at the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, an economics writer, and uh, he told us that uh, there was actually interest uh, in the publishing uh, world in us, uh, and he suggested that we uh, uh, circulate the uh, book proposals. And so in the summer of 1976, uh, I took time out, I still have it. Uh, no word processor, uh, so this I don't have electronically, I have it uh, uh, in one of my files. I drafted a lengthy uh, and heartfelt book proposal entitled Going Home to Glory. Uh, now, 35 years later, uh, this book has finally seen the light uh, of day. Now, flash forward about 18 months, uh, one of the first things I did when I uh, finally uh, found a home of the publisher is uh, <clears throat> on the subject of Dwight Eisenhower, I decided to take time out and travel the country uh, to interview uh, living associates of uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and I spent uh, nine uh, months, 12 months, or whatever, uh, on the road as one of the great adventures. Uh, of my life, literally uh, east coast or west coast. I don't know how many times uh, uh, I can claim credit for driving this country, but I drove it at least three times uh, uh, in that period. And I was uh, able to work in uh, an invitation. It was a thrilling invitation uh, 
and I received uh, in the mail, as we were living in California at the time, from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, from the National Decisions Program at University of uh, uh, Pennsylvania, an invitation extended by Professors Von Boris uh, and Henry Tooney uh, to come and address their National Decisions Seminar. Well, <clears throat> I remember that day, it was my uh, first, second day at Penn, or third day, uh, but uh, I can remember that day like yesterday. In fact, I can date it because I was in an interview uh, with the University of Pennsylvania radio show and emerged from it to find out that Bucky Dent uh, had hit a home run to uh, uh, defeat the Boston Red Sox in a, in a playoff game. So that is October 1978, and that was very precise. I remember that day, uh, I was the invited guest uh, of these uh, two individuals. Uh, I was not sure how I had done. Uh, uh, Professor Von Boris, as many must remember, uh, was a rather forbidding uh, individual. He certainly had a forbidding exterior. Uh, and I received a letter uh, when I got back uh, to California. I hoped uh, that they would uh, uh, keep me in mind or that our uh, paths would cross again. Then about 18 months later, uh, my wife and I, the entire family, moved back to the East Coast from California. And by Jove, as we move into our home, practically as we move into our home, I have another letter uh, from Dr. Von Boris and Dr. Tooney inviting me to return to the National Decisions uh, uh, Seminar and to uh, give a second presentation. Uh, the, and I assume from this that I'd done all right the first time. <coughs> uh, in time, I became a regular uh, in that <coughs> seminar. In time, I became a lecturer uh, at University of Pennsylvania and given an office, uh, which was uh, uh, very thrilling. Henry Tooney uh, made a gift of faculty club membership uh, to me in 1983 <coughs> on my birthday. And I will never forget getting a faculty uh, club card uh, that day and feeling that uh, now I was uh, uh, kind of a, at least an honorary member of the team. Uh, and this uh, developed uh, from 1983 forward and I assumed uh, uh, growing responsibilities. <coughs> we formed a very deep friendship, uh, and this dates back to the days when the faculty club was next door in the Fine Arts Building. And we had lots of space, and routinely after classes, uh, midday, we would uh, go over there for the so-called happy hour, uh, and I was exposed to ideas enough for a lifetime in the presence of Henry Tooney and uh, <coughs> Carl Von Boris. I took countless notes on little matchbooks and scraps of paper uh, that I would take home and I would transcribe onto note cards and so forth from our uh, conversations. At the time, I was moonlighting uh, at Penn. My primary uh, job was to uh, push out this uh, major book on, on uh, uh, World War II, uh, and I was moonlighting at Penn. And I came to uh, crave uh, the stimulation uh, and the friendship and the warmth of the University of Pennsylvania Faculty Club uh, in that period. It was an opportunity to test ideas. I think this is something that the professors, the people here at the University of Pennsylvania take for granted. Uh, it is something that a self-employed writer does not uh, necessarily have access to. You work in isolation. I was working in isolation at the time. Now I would say that uh, in the course of years, my roles have been reversed. I'm now moonlighting as a writer uh, and working full-time here at Penn. I can't say that moonlighting is the relief that working that uh, my association with Penn in the 1980s was a relief from writing. Uh, in fact, uh, I find myself right now in this stage of life uh, developing and completing manuscripts and drafts uh, that took shape uh, in that period, and I expect to spend the rest of my life uh, doing that. That is filling in the blanks between. Uh, the various Eisenhower projects that I've published and extending it uh, on uh, into the next years. At the time, in 1978, uh, I was involved in a strange process uh, as far as uh, this Eisenhower project went. I literally wrote <coughs> The Life and Times of Dwight Eisenhower and I decided to confine uh, that uh, project to his public years, uh, if I could. Uh, I literally wrote that project backwards. Uh, when I was here for National Decisions in the fall of 1978, I was also dropping off uh, a version uh, of the book which Simon & Schuster has just uh, uh, published now. Uh, that was the very first thing that I drafted. When I completed my interview swing uh, across the country,
country, and I interviewed about 60, 70 of uh, Dwight Eisner's living associates at that time, uh, I drafted the uh, uh, thing that was uh, most fresh in my mind, uh, which were the years that I knew Dwight Eisenhower uh, personally, well, best. Uh, the years between 1961 and 1969, literally the moment when I turned 13 uh, to the moment he died, which was my 21st birthday. Uh, so my teen years and my uh, first two 20 years uh, were spent in his presence and we were very close. Uh, we lived on the uh, corner of the farm uh, <clears throat> and uh, we saw him regularly. Uh, unlike other members of my family, I was sent away to school and so I had a, a long correspondence uh, with my grandfather, which also aided and prompted my recollection in putting this book together. But this was a very vivid story uh, in my mind, and when my editor saw it in the fall of 1978, he says, this is something that you absolutely must put out uh, someday. This is, uh, uh, this is a, a wonderful chronicle. This is a shorter version uh, of the book that uh, I put out the last fall. What I found is that uh, in, with that draft in hand, I had difficulty starting it. Uh, I did not really see at the time how you could start uh, a book in 1961, say January, uh, and uh, not cover 1960, the year that preceded it. Uh, and that would be the uh, year that, uh, in which uh, Dwight Eisenhower's grand effort uh, to conclude the uh, Cold War uh, crashed and was destroyed by the U-2 affair. Uh, it was the year of the uh, narrow election defeat in the fall, which uh, cast a cloud uh, over the Eisner years and has uh, permanently affected his reputation in history. In fact, I didn't see how uh, I could start in 61 without covering that. How can you cover the Berlin crisis in isolation uh, uh, and the U-2 without covering also the Berlin crisis? which is connected to the disarmament controversies of 1957, which is connected with the landings in Lebanon in 1958, and the uh, crisis in Syria of 57, which is connected to the rise of Nasser uh, in 1953 and 54, and the Suez Affair of 1956, which is connected with the 1956 election, uh, which cannot be understood except in the context of the 1955 Geneva summit, uh, and all of the hopes attending that, which was the culmination of a process uh, that Eisenhower sets in motion when inaugurated to end the war in Korea, uh, to prevent intervention in, in Indochina. None of that is comprehensible unless one goes into the politics of the 1952 election and so on and so on and so on. And so I kept drafting backwards. Well, I tried drafting forwards uh, from birth, and um, I encountered some difficulties there, and the difficulties were, uh, I would say, relevance. Uh, I finally found a point, uh, and this describes the work that I was doing here at Penn uh, when I got to know uh, Dr. Von Boris and Dr. Tooney. I found a point, and this is the fall of 1943, uh, and it literally opens, uh, this is the war book, uh, opens with the great conference uh, between Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt, uh, at which the supreme commander of the invasion of France uh, is uh, mandated, actually named about three or four days uh, after the conference, the persistent Soviet question in that conference is not to discuss the details of uh, their support uh, for Amer Anglo-American landings in the channel, but uh, to be assured that this operation would actually occur in 1944, the constant refrain in this conference is, what is his name? What is the name of the commander of this operation? What is his name? And that's how the 1943, 44, 45 Chronicle opens. This is a point where I think it can be said that nothing that happened between, say, 1890, when Dwight Eisenhower was born, and 1943, when he assumes his position, could have specifically prepared him for the challenges that he undertook between 1943 and 1945. By contrast, what happens to Dwight Eisenhower between 1943 and 1945 makes it predictable and, in, and inevitable that he be president of the United States. What happens to the United States between 1943 and 45, the fate that befalls our armies uh, in Western Europe, uh, makes it inevitable and natural that the United States would assume a leading role uh, in constructing the peace in both Europe and Asia 
when this was over. Well, that was uh, uh, how I started uh, the War Chronicle and so forth. And over the uh, course of years, uh, uh, I have uh, all, also uh, been teaching uh, full time and so forth. And the time eventually came to start considering uh, developing the rest of these drafts uh, for uh, publication. Uh, <clears throat> reach this point uh, was uh, uh, the advice of my initial editor. Resume here uh, was the advice of my current editor. Resume. Uh, with the story 1961 to 1969. In a strange way, what I've published so far then on Dwight Eisenhower uh, is uh, first the most familiar story to me, but the least political of all the stories. It's going home to glory, 61 to 69. And the story least familiar to me, 1943 to 45, predating my birth, uh, but the most meaningful politically. Uh, uh, and so on in understanding the uh, public career of Dwight Eisenhower. As my father said memorably about five weeks ago, sometimes on the phone with him, he's 89 years old and doing very well, living on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, and so on, and he said, uh, uh, he was calling to say he uh, enjoyed this and enjoyed that uh, about uh, going home to glory and uh, uh, appreciated uh, the plans that I had this summer uh, to develop a six-part uh, study of the Eisenhower presidency, and that uh, resumes, and of course that's in draft. He says, but David, uh, never forget the only thing that matters about Dwight Eisenhower's life uh, is that uh, D-Day went off on time and all right on June 6, 1944. There's actually a story uh, that uh, my uncle Milton tells, and it's a completely true story. I've actually seen pictures of my grandfather and my great uncle Milton uh, together uh, on the day in question. This was in June of 1954, 10 years after D-Day. Uh, President Eisenhower was the commencement speaker at Penn State. And his brother, Milton, was president of Penn State. And the ceremony was scheduled for outdoors. Uh, there is overcast weather. I see the sun coming out. But there is overcast weather, inclement weather, threatening uh, the event. And Milton is racing around saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't don't know what I'm going to do, Dwight, what do you think? And he sat back and smiled and said to Milton, since June 6, 1944, Milton, I've never worried about the rain. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we are on, I am on my way to the Celtic lands next week. This is something exciting that has come up uh, for us under the auspices of the Penn Alumni uh, Association. Penn is a co-sponsor, and so I have permission to go. I am leading an educational cruise to the Celtic lands. Uh, and this is a cruise that begins with a tour of the Normandy battlefronts. Uh, this is early May, not early June. Uh, and so probably like Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1944, I am worrying about the rain. Uh, uh, next week, I'm looking forward very much to this uh, cruise. Well, I've told the most familiar and the least familiar. Uh, the current book, uh, Going Home to Glory, is the most familiar. There is a wider story involved here. Uh, and this is something that uh, Henry and I discussed for uh, a number of years in passing. When I originally drafted this thing, I wasn't sure it would ever see the light of day. I thought maybe I was writing a time capsule, something that I would uh, preserve or bequeath uh, to children and so forth. But since uh, this thing has been published, uh, one of the things that I had to consider in preparing it for publication, that is expanding it, uh, is the wider story involved. Uh, there is a wider story in Going Home to Glory, and that is uh, uh, Presidents in Twilight. Uh, what follows uh, the White House uh, for a chief uh, executive, which has been the subject in recent years of several very outstanding recent books that sort of been, uh, crystallized or inspired this theme uh, in finalizing Going Home to Glory. I'm the admirer of a couple of books that I can name. One is Douglas Brinkley's The Unfinished Presidency, uh, which is an important book, probably the best book written on Jimmy Carter, in my opinion. Uh, I am an admirer of Candace Millard's River of Doubt, uh, which chronicles the restless Teddy Roosevelt in 1913 and 1914 as he worked off the shock of his defeat in the 1912 election by organizing a journey through the uncharted regions of the Amazon basin. And he almost dies in the process. It's the river of, the, river of doubt, in fact, is the river that they're exploring. The River of Doubt is one of the most important character sketches of any president uh, ever written, and 
and Teddy Roosevelt is a very vivid and important presidential personality, of course, and I believe that the topic is a significant one. It is significant in a country, ours, uh, which operates with a 22nd Amendment which requires our chiefs of state to step down after a second elected term imposing limits on powerful and charismatic individuals who in many places around the world would rule forever. We not only require them to step down, we require them to like stepping down, uh, to enjoy it. <coughs> it emphasizes that the president is a citizen first, and for going home with glory might have been uh, entitled Citizen Eisenhower, but we uh, <coughs> but, uh, have always been set on that title as well. Accordingly, as that theme crystallized, as I turned to the question of publication, uh, I heightened uh, sections uh, that opened this story with a description of the afternoon and the evening of January 20th, 1961, as expectant throngs numbering practically a million people uh, <clears throat> descend on Washington, D.C. for the inauguration of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. In the snows blanketing the region, the Eisenhower were making their way home to Gettysburg, driving past thousands of well-wishers uh, who lined up with signs along the entire 80-mile route from Washington to Gettysburg. On tap is a fa family dinner that night, uh, which will be held in our home, which is on the corner of the Eisenhower farm. And this was going to be their new home. And as one almost 13 years old, I can remember the grown-ups uh, rising one after another to uh, toast each other and to toast the future uh, and to remember the past, uh, there was a distinct sense that the Eisenhowers were beginning uh, a new life. Uh, American historians look on January 20th, 1961 as a beginning, and it certainly was, uh, and for us in Gettysburg and the Eisenhower family, it was a beginning uh, as well, but of a different kind. In the years to follow, former President Eisenhower uh, is not leading his staff and family uh, along the river of doubt, though he has reasons to doubt, which I chronicle in this book. Uh, in 1961, he had transferred power to the opposition, uh, and Dwight Eisenhower had few illusions as a former president what the narrow defeat of 1960 implied for him, implied for his political legacy, and perhaps uh, the future not only of his party, but the future of the country, he certainly had misgivings uh, about this entire transition process. Nor is Dwight Eisenhower really completing an unfinished presidency, uh, but as my father would later put it, uh, it is impossible uh, for someone to be a president uh, and to serve two terms uh, and to leave the office without regrets. It's impossible. There was considerable unfinished business uh, on paper, I draw on documents from the Eisner Library and other libraries, the Johnson Library that I went to and the uh, Kennedy Library, which provided many important sources for this book, uh, to document Dwight Eisner's role as a counselor ex officio uh, to President Kennedy during the Berlin Crisis of 1961, the Laotian Crisis of 1961, which was ongoing as he left office, uh, Cuba uh, in the spring of 1961, and most importantly, Cuba in 1962, I actually have uh, audio recordings of conversations between uh, General Eisenhower and President Kennedy at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, which uh, brings to mind an adage about the American presidency, uh, and that is we pay Americans to get it right. Uh, there's an exchange between Eisenhower and Kennedy at one, one point that uh, uh, fascinates me uh, and that is on the date, October 22, Kennedy is about to announce uh, the embargo of Cuba on television. Uh, he reached General Eisenhower on the sun porch of the farm, and his question for him was this. My experts are divided, General Eisenhower. Uh, one half believe that the Soviets will connect any measures that we do in, uh, in Cuba uh, with Berlin that this is related to their negotiating position on Berlin, uh, and that if we move in this sector, they will move in that sector. My other school of advisors say that the Soviets will not draw a connection uh, between the two, and that we can safely move against Cuba. What is your advice, General? And his advice was, they are not related. You can move. 
We pay presidents to get it right. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, an example of the many consultations and so forth that Dwight Eisenhower has in this period, as well as uh, with President Johnson on Vietnam later. He is also involved in 1963 as the civil rights questions uh, begin to build. Uh, and as the Republican Party begins to hammer out a position on the omnibus civil rights uh, legislation that John Kennedy submits uh, in June of 1963, he is also involved with the Republican leadership, I would not say uh, joyously, uh, but he is involved with the Republican leadership in 1963, the Goldwater year of 1964, and 1965 as the Republicans begin to chart a comeback after Johnson's landslide victory uh, of uh, 1964. But this presidency is uh, in large measure complete. Uh, there is a turning of the page in 1961. 61, I think, marks uh, the end of the post-war. Uh, and uh, there's a palpable sense of this uh, in the Kennedy inaugural. There is also a palpable sense of a speech that I love teaching uh, here at the University of Pennsylvania. I run a program uh, here, one of my uh, great privileges. Uh, we send students every semester on stipends to every presidential library, Library of Congress, National Archives, and Records Administration around the country. We are the only university to do this. Uh, we are accumulating uh, an inventory of scholarship on presidential speeches that exists nowhere. One of the most interesting stories in the presidential archives on presidential speeches is the evolution of the Eisenhower Farewell Address delivered on January 17, 1961, containing the form famous warning against the unwarranted acquisition of influence by a military industrial complex. There are 40 drafts of this speech. And if you have 40 drafts of a speech, I have a student who comes up with 40 drafts of a speech, they have one heck of a paper. Uh, they can demonstrate uh, in a paper the evolution of an idea. And an idea does evolve, does evolve uh, in the drafting that began shortly after the 1960 election. The first third, roughly 13 drafts of this speech contain a warning against his successor. In other words, you have this appallingly close election. You have a sense that it should have been otherwise. Uh, and Eisenhower, emerging from the campaign, um, voices uh, his displeasure over the result uh, and his misgivings about the future. It is essentially a warning to the nation against his successor. Somebody intervenes, or Eisenhower's common sense intervenes, or somewhere around Thanksgiving, somebody steps in and says, you can't do that. Uh, the point of a farewell address, this is part of a ritual of transition, it is to make your successor's job easier. Uh, Truman made your job easier uh, with his farewell address, that is, that is your duty. So for the next uh, 13 drafts or so, you have all of the qualifications, uh, the double negatives, what I really meant to say on one hand, on the other hand, and so forth, and the entire effort collapses in confusion. The final 13 drafts, accomplished with the greatest farewell address in history uh, uh, was probably always meant to accomplish. The gaze, which is forward in the first 26 drafts, suddenly turns backward. This becomes the classical farewell in American history. It is not about the future, it is a retrospective on the 20th century and the great riddle of the 20th century that confronted the leadership uh, of that era. That is how we could combine such rapid, overwhelming material progress and growth with such catastrophes as World War I, uh, the Great Depression, and World War II. There's a sense that uh, uh, technology is not under control. There's a sense that popular controls have somehow been eclipsed. There's a dark foreboding uh, that science can manipulate public opinion and create realities uh, contrary to our uh, principles and values uh, and so forth. What did all of this mean? Uh, and in adopting that perspective, Dwight Eisenhower decisively, I think, puts his signature period uh, on the era of post-war construction, and there is a transition in 1961 uh, to uh, Kennedy. With finality, uh, I think, meant in, in place, Dwight Eisenhower did enjoy satisfaction. Uh, by the mid and late 1960s, when I knew him best, uh, he was looking back uh, and enjoying, I think, appraisals of his presidency. 
his presidency has been reappraised many times. He's been called an underestimated figure many times. His uh, ear is constantly being rediscovered uh, because it's a, uh, its virtues are subtle in many ways, but this is a time of peace and prosperity and stability. A long peace is, in fact, underway, and it had provided in the 1950s a setting for innovation uh, as America enters the space age, the computer age, the television age, the atomic age, as we build an interstate highway system, uh, as we build more schools uh, than existed uh, before World War II, as we adopt new living patterns, uh, as the civil rights uh, question uh, develops great momentum in the 1950s and 1960s. All of this is advanced uh, by wise and careful planning. The Eisenhower era is the era of consolidation of success uh, emerging from the Depression in World War II. What follows as well in this book is, is the predominant theme, which is uh, Citizen Eisenhower. It is a character sketch of uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and I think a character sketch is perhaps uh, most doable or most practical uh, of a president uh, when that president is not in office. It's far easier to know a former president. Uh, it is um, far easier to know somebody before they reach the presidency. It is difficult to know a president uh, in office. The setting that I saw him in was a very natural one. I felt that, um, I won't say he was happy, I won't say he was sad. I would say that uh, every General picture I have of Dwight Eisenhower in this period, uh, uh, I see it, uh, uh, is uh, one that uh, conjures up the word, uh, word natural. Uh, somebody who's going about something that he was sort of meant to do. Uh, I knew him in the capacity of neighbor. Uh, he was a general and former president to be sure, but he was a farmer. Uh, and he was a hunter, painter. He was a Civil War student. He was a former ball player. Uh, one of the stories I tell uh, in this uh, book is, uh, in fact, related to me by uh, the inventor of the tape measure home run, Red Patterson, uh, who I spent an evening with in 1979. The Nixons uh, uh, took me to a, a game at Anaheim. We wound up sitting in the owner's box. Red Patterson, director of publicity for the California Angels, inventor of the tape measure home run, uh, spoke of accompanying General Eisenhower to the polo grounds for a Dodger Giant game in 1947. Eisenhower was in uniform. Uh, at the time, and Red Patterson confronted him with rumors throughout organized baseball that General Eisenhower had actually played uh, professional baseball in the Central Kansas League uh, in 1909, 1910, or thereabouts, uh, and kept, keeps this under wraps, of course, because if he ever admits receiving money uh, for athletic contests, he would have been ineligible for football <coughs> at West Point. And what Patterson said to him was, uh, General, uh, we understand you played under the alias of Wilson. Our records show that there were two Wilsons in that league. Which one were you? And Eisenhower's reply was, the one that could hit. <laughs> I have gone back since publication of this book, by the way. I've discovered a website called ba BaseballReference.com. I've gone to the Central Kansas League, uh, and records of that league actually exist uh, online. And by Jove, 1909-1910, Central Kansas League, there are two Wilsons in that league, and one can hit and one can't. Uh, and the one that could hit played for a town, a very meaningful town, Abilene. <laughs> I knew him as a sage. I knew him as a supervisor. I knew him as a companion, uh, and more so uh, as the years uh, went by. I was not unaware of politics. Uh, but uh, ours was not a political home. In fact, I, was, uh, I would say I grew up uh, rather apolitical. Uh, which is, uh, may sound strange. I was a disappointment uh, at Exeter, the political activists on all sides that wanted to list me for debating teams. Uh, I thought everybody was a Republican uh, growing up. I didn't know that there were such things as Democrats. Uh, I was a perfect foil at Exeter for the greatest uh, practical joke in Phillips Exeter history. Bob Seifarth, who's on our faculty here, uh, can probably relate it. He's a classmate of mine and so forth. And that was my nomination and election by acclamation in absentia. Uh, to the only partisan political office I've ever held in my life, and that's Secretary of Treasury, Young Democrats, uh, Phillips Exeter Academy. This was a practical joke worked out by my friends. I thought this was like getting a faculty club card from Henry Tooney. I thought this meant that I belonged, uh, so I was delighted. It became a news story. My parents read it with great delight. They thought it was funny. My grandfather read the same story, didn't think it was funny at all. Uh, the man I'd known affectionately for, uh, as granddad for some time, I came to know as general. 
uh, when that news uh, uh, came out uh, and so forth, and so I safely uh, returned to the fold. Our main focus in this period was the business, the family business, and that was the farm. Uh, nightly conversations, uh, the Civil War on Friday nights. My grandfather was an expert uh, on that conflict, as was my father, and I enjoyed listening in and sitting in this. I'd say if I have any predisposition uh, in academia, it's not uh, towards politics, but it's uh, towards military uh, affairs and military history, but there is a connection and so forth, and I have learned politics as I've gone along. Talking about cattle, talking about <coughs> uh, crop rotations, uh, the rainfall, and so forth. These were a nightly topic of conversations. It was in this process that, uh, or in this time, that I got to know my grandfather's business side. He hired me five times uh, to work uh, at the farm uh, over the summers for 25 cents an hour. I eventually got uh, promoted to 35, 40 cents uh, an hour. That, that was big money. Uh, in the 1960s. Uh, he hired me. Uh, he was the first to fire me. Uh, I uh, <clears throat> went too long on a lunch break one day uh, and was uh, surprised. I thought he'd gone back to the office uh, with a couple of compatriots to find out he was still on the grounds. Uh, he walked in and broke up a, a game of uh, poker. And I don't remember a whole lot except the word, you are fired. Uh, <clears throat> happily, uh, or I would say anxiously, I awaited uh, uh, the resolution of this thing that day. That was midsummer of 1963. Uh, we had a golf date in there, and Granddad and I would go out uh, after work and play golf about twice a week. We would play nine holes in about an hour and 15 minutes to get us to a country club. We had a golf, golf date, two of us, and I wasn't sure whether he was going to show up at our house to pick me up or not. And the car rumbles up. Uh, there he is. Uh, so I grabbed my clubs and went out and sat in the back seat and said nothing. We drove in silence to the country club. We played the first hole in silence. We played the second hole in silence. At the end of the third hole, he said uh, to me, uh, you know, I allow my associates one mistake a year and you've had yours. And by the fourth hole, I was rehired, uh, proving that to err is human, but to forgive divine. <laughs> I found myself drawn into national affairs little by little by the civil rights Great Awakening in 1963 by the Vietnam War, which had seamlessly developed in the 1960s. One of the last things I remember about the White House was our final dinner in the White House. Uh, in January 1961, when all the painting was being done to greet the Kennedys, and I can remember sitting in the family dining room, this is the very room that was converted by Carl Rove into the war room of 2004, where they coordinated the massive turnouts uh, in Ohio and so forth. That was once listed one of the top uh, America's uh, top 100 uh, rooms by Architectural Digest. Uh, it, it was a masterpiece in the eyes of our ears, and it was the family dining room. And I can remember sitting uh, at dinner in January and listening to my uh, grandfather and my great uncle Milton, who was uh, his closest counselor at the time, discussing a transition meeting uh, with President elect Kennedy uh, about the unfolding situation in Laos. I took from that a, uh, a sense that this was a very serious situation uh, for which America did not have ready answers, uh, and that sooner or later we would be confronting a major war uh, in that theater. And uh, as that war developed, of course, I became uh, interested in the where, as all my classmates were uh, in Vietnam, and that is covered in the book. It's also drawn into it by the Republican Revival, uh, 1965 and 66. In uh, by complete coincidence, in the fall of 1966, I turned up in Amherst. Uh, my wife, Julie, turned up at Smith. We had met twice before. We hardly knew each other. Uh, my grandmother insisted I go over and call on her. I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to put her on the spot. But finally, uh, we had to coordinate our responses to a Republican Party invitation in the area. So I called on her at Baldwin House, liked her uh, instantly. Uh, asked her out for a dish of ice cream, discovered I'd spent all my money on the cab getting over there, so she picked up the tab. <laughs> uh, I got up the nerve to go back, uh, and so on, and uh, this relationship uh, uh, evolved very quickly. Uh, and suddenly I found myself swept up in this great story of the 1968 campaign, uh, of which I also have a major uh, manuscript uh, in hand of one that I will publish, uh, probably while uh, hopefully I'm still here at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. This was a very revealing, uh, a sort of an awakening for me, 
is watching the candidate deliver maybe 140 speeches in that campaign, uh, traveling to 40 some states, uh, combining that with uh, attendance, somewhat irregular, uh, at uh, Amherst in the spring semester of my sophomore year, fall semester of my junior year. Uh, step by step, I found myself introduced into a world that I had missed, that my grandfather had known. Uh, I found myself uh, in a national campaign and seeing how that works. I see how presidential missions form. One of the great impressions that I took away from that and teach here at the University of Pennsylvania uh, is a notion about how the presidency works. The presidency is, in the final analysis, a mission-oriented job. If one is to understand how a presidency works under our system, or if one is to attempt historical analysis of a president, the first question you ask is, what are the larger circumstances? What is the great issue that accounts for this presidency coming into being in the first place? When a president is addressing mission, the president is a strong president. You know. uh, mission infuses the presidency with a vast array of formal and informal powers. Uh, when mission is fulfilled, there's an ironic uh, effect. Uh, the fulfillment of mission does not mean future effectiveness in the American presidency. It means uh, uh, it, what it inaugurates is a process of identifying the next great mission and identifying the next individual uh, who will organize the team that will confront the next great mission. Dwight Eisenhower's presidency is uh, <clears throat> part of this. He was elected in 1952 because he was a hero, but above all because he had the qualities, the qualifications to confront the overriding issue of 1952, which is the breakdown of uh, 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 peace in Europe, the threat of general war in Europe, and the uh, regional uh, endless war uh, in Korea, which had brought uh, American politics to a state of paralysis. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, by 1956, having solved the Vietnam War, avoided uh, additional wars, and having actually opened a dialogue with the Soviet counterparts, was a complete success uh, by any yardstick, one would apply in measuring success in the White House, I believe. This is not the beginning of an Eisenhower era in the American presidency, it's the beginning of a long transition uh, that culminates in the 1960 elections, and this point arises over and over and over again uh, in presidencies. Uh, Richard Nixon, 1968, campaigns on a riddle, uh, a pledge to end the war in Vietnam and win the peace. That's a riddle. Americans win wars to win the peace. You don't end a war and win the peace. You win wars and win the peace. This riddle implied that the relationship between any outcome in Vietnam and America's wider objectives uh, was now assuming a different meaning in a new world order that Nixon intended to fashion. This was a forecast for years of complete delegation by the Congress and by most of the executive branch to the Nixon Kissinger team, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, of American foreign, politi uh, foreign policy uh, to redeem uh, the unfolding Vietnam tragedy. In January of 1973, Henry Kissinger calls Nixon, and I heard this pledge offered over and over again in speeches in 1968. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but audiences uh, seem to understand it. Uh, he's elected, and this means a uh, strife-ridden uh, but uh, very significant presidency in January 1973 culminates with Kissinger's call to Nixon from Paris saying, Mr. President, we are three for three. We have ended the war in Vietnam. We have opened China, and we have the detente that we set out to forge with the Soviet Union in 1969. We are three for three. At his second inaugural, he's a complete success. Uh, by any yardstick, one would apply measuring success in the office to that point. It's not the beginning of the Nixon era of the American presidency, it's the beginning of his problems. Bush, same thing, complete success in 1992. Franklin Roosevelt, partial success in 1940, which, uh, <clears throat> uh, and also a domestic president. Domestic missions tend to be uh, longer, but I could uh, expound on the point and so on. But the presidency is a mission a job, and I can see that in 1968. Well, uh, this is uh, uh, a formula uh, for evaluating presidencies. Uh, presidents, I've learned subsequently as well, have a great deal in common uh, as personalities. Uh, they even have behavioral patterns in common. I can remember an experience that we had, uh, or I was recalling an experience we had at an event that we did in Yorba Linda uh, last fall 
And that was the first time that I saw the Nixon birthplace, uh, which had been acquired by a foundation and saved from demolition uh, in York, London, 1989. And it is now the site of the Nixon Library Birthplace Foundation, uh, which is uh, one of the gems in the National Archives and Record Administration uh, system. And I can remember seeing Nixon's boyhood home for the first time and being stunned by it. I mean, I, I knew Nixon as well as anybody. I, I spent 22 years in company with him as a uh, former president. I was around for most of his presidency, and I was uh, there throughout the 67 and 68 uh, uh, year and so forth. And I always thought, and this is powerfully reinforced by the interaction I have with people, that these are two very different people. I turn Nixon. I walked into the Nixon boyhood home in Yorba Linda in 1989 with uh, the future chairman of the Nixon Foundation. And I walked into the same house that Dwight Eisenhower was raised in in Ablett, 1,500 miles away, with a picture of the same mother on the wall, and the picture of the same father on the wall, and the same five brothers. And I walked upstairs and I saw the same beds that these boys shared. It was identical. It's like the boys from Brazil or something. Uh, <coughs> cloning. I got a letter from Bonnie Angelo, who was uh, writing a book on first families, and she says, you know, I've noticed a striking similarity uh, between Eisenhower and Nixon. Have you noticed? And I said, well, not only have I noticed that, but I've also read other biographies of other presidents, and I noticed uh, this recurring pattern of a frustrated, uh, driven but frustrated and angry father or non-existent father, the gentle, saintly, redeeming mother, lots of brothers usually, not always. Uh, but a circumstance that thrusts young people into early responsibility, which either breaks them or makes them. Uh, this is the way presidents are <clears throat> raised, uh, in a way. That's been the pattern. You have uh, Eisenhower with a failed father and the religious mother and all these brothers. You have Lyndon Johnson, same pattern, alcoholic father. You have uh, Gerald Ford, no father, uh, <clears throat> uh, in fact, adopted. Uh, by a father, you have uh, Ronald Reagan, alcoholic father, disciple of Christ's mother, uh, a couple of uh, brothers. You've got William Clinton, no father, uh, mother is a nurse. You have Jimmy Carter, father, uh, local courthouse politician, neglectful mother, Peace Corps volunteer, Barack Obama, in search of his father. His mother's a nurse, or whatever she was. She was a social activist, I guess, and so forth, the recurring pattern. So the presidents have uh, certainly behavioral uh, things in common, and that's something I came to appreciate. They have motivation, they are engines that know no rest, and they have great idealism and drive and vision. And this is all necessary in leadership. I want to emphasize in closing that this is a chronicle that I wanted to do, uh, as well as one that was uh, sort of in hand. Uh, when uh, my editor, Robert Bender, said, let's resume here. Uh, I, of course, accepted his uh, suggestion, and I was delighted to do so. Uh, there is a need in doing a book like this, um, <clears throat> uh, I think, uh, uh, which is instinctive and rather general. Last fall, uh, Julie and I were interviewed by the Philadelphia Inquirer, Art Carey. His wife, Tanya, is here. In fact, she's in the uh, faculty club uh, quite often. Uh, Tanya, and she's a, a personal friend. She works at Kasi, uh, several blocks away and so forth. But Art uh, did a profile on us. He arrived at our home uh, to write this profile carrying a bound book that he and his brothers and sisters had put together uh, and it's beautifully done, it's beautifully produced as uh, my book is uh, by Simon Schuster uh, on their grandfather. Uh, somebody who was very special in their lives, uh, somebody who made uh, a real difference. Uh, and <clears throat> there seems to be in our carry, and this is something that I encountered throughout last fall when I was taking travels uh, on behalf of this book, uh, there seems to be a deep need uh, to acknowledge these people uh, and the legacy that they impart, uh, uh, often a very private one, but impart uh, in their own uh, family. So the topic of going home to glory uh, is secondarily political image, that of the general in World War II, uh, of the president, and uh, so forth. But above all, uh, this is justified as an effort to expand that image and to make a record of other times uh, that Eisenhower should be remembered for as well, uh, times when it was possible to know him, to receive his advice for uh, <clears throat> good living and his uh, guidance and support to appreciate his enthusiasms and to see the personal example 
he set of serenity and faith by his frank acceptance of limitations as his health failed uh, in the late 1960s. I am mindful that it may seem strange that uh, the United States, uh, which has assumed a preeminent role in international affairs and did so in 1944 and 1945, uh, have built in discontinuity in political leadership. Uh, Americans through the 22nd Amendment discount the principle of the best man for the job, uh, and they do so. But this brings me back to Henry Tooney uh, and Von Boris and all the uh, seamless lessons on American democracy uh, that we used to uh, uh, our seminars uh, on this topic over in the Fine Arts Building and so forth, tapping their experiences in places like Malaysia and in Indonesia, Pakistan, Yugoslavia. Uh, Henry was always going to Poland, he was going to Strasbourg, Central Asia, Japan, Russia. These were widely traveled individuals and so forth. One of the important challenges facing any society <coughs> is the question of transition. It is important, Dr. Von Boris and Dr. Tooney used to argue, uh, that leaders make way for new leadership and to assure conditions that leadership is allowed to flourish <coughs> at many levels in every walk of life and so forth. And that has been the secret of American success and dynamism. This is a point that stuck with me. This is a point that I took down on many matchboxes uh, and wrote down on many napkins <coughs> at 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. at the Fine Arts Building. So in a sense, going home to glory, uh, not the first or the last Eisner and Nixon book that I will complete uh, is one that I can say surely was influenced by my friends at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Von Boris, Dr. Tooney, Henry Tooney, great educators, great friends, and great minds, people that I will never forget. Thank you.